How do you breed carpet pythons? If that's what you're interested in, that's probably why you're here. I'm gonna tell you. Put the boy snake in with the girl snake, leave them alone, wait till you get eggs, and then eggs hatch. And you have bred carpet pythons. Nah. I wouldn't do you like that. Let's go. I'll explain a little further. All right, well, cheers to you if you are here looking for information on how to breed carpet pythons. Because I know how to do that. This will be my 10th year breeding snakes in general coming up, and over half of that time I've spent breeding carpet pythons. So, before we dive into this, I would like to preface this video by saying a few things, a few disclaimers. One, I am no expert. I am not the overall authority on any of this stuff. I've learned from people who've come before me who have learned from people who came before them. So this is a passing of the torch, so to speak. So don't, uh, don't judge me too harshly. Number two, there's more than one way to skin a cat. This is not the only approach that is successful for people, uh, not just in the United States, but in Australia and outside of the country, uh, everywhere, whatever. So there's more than one approach. And the third thing I'd like to bring up is uh, I'm speaking specifically from my experiences here in the United States, with United States-based carpet pythons, and for the purposes of this video, I'm going to strictly be speaking about the winter breeders, i.e. the Darwins, the Coastals, the Jungles, the Popwins. We're going to do the Brettles, Inlands, and Diamonds, i.e. the Spring Breeders, in another video. Uh, hopefully by then I will have a little more experience to speak of on that, but until then, we're just going to focus on those, so just an FYI. All right. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? So first things first, in order to breed carpet pythons, you need two. You need a male and you need a female, okay? So I always recommend starting with babies, getting them young, and then raising them up in your own system of care for several years so that by the time they are adults, they're used to you, your routine, that wasn't very nice, and uh, everything else that might get thrown their way. So start with some babies, make sure you start with a pair, make sure they're a pair, if you have to do one at a time, get your female first, get her raising up, and then get your male because females need to be a little bit more mature than males. This girl will need to hit about four or five years before she is ready to breed. Males can breed much younger. So this boy could probably breed two years old, maybe three, depending on how he grows and how he's fed. So first things first, you need a pair and you need to grow them up to a minimum age of, let's say, five for ma or females and three for males, just to play it safe. All right, so you're five years down the line with that female, you've got your male, he's two to three years old, he's ready to rock. Obviously males don't have to be as large as females, they aren't doing any egg carrying, but females need to have plenty of fat stores. Size and maturity are very important for her to be successful. If you try and breed them too young or too small, you can have a whole heck of a lot of complications that can even result in something as extreme as the animal passing away. And that we want to avoid. So make sure they're good, mature, well-fed, and this all starts when they're young. This whole process of breeding starts with how you condition them and raise them up, their fat stores, how they're brought up. I firmly believe that cycling uh, animals seasonally, even when they're not breeding, is healthy for them, gives them a break in, in their digestive system functioning during the winter, and it also preps them for the winter time. So assuming we've fast-forwarded this clock, a few years you've been cycling your animals you've been feeding them well raising them up and the year has come they are ready to breed your girl is nice and big your male is pacing the enclosure he's looking like he's ready to give it a shot all right so if we're there let's say we're hitting winter time okay when you hit winter time as i'm filming this right now we just dipped into december you should have already spent the fall or you know late summer into fall feeding as much as possible to that female, getting her big, getting her fat, getting a lot of fat stores in her to ideally trigger her body to say, okay, we've been getting tons of food. We can definitely reproduce. We've got enough fat stores, no problem. 
So that's going to be around July through August, September, October, however you feel. It'll start getting cold and that's when you're going to want to start making sure that they're primed and ready and uh, getting ready to cut them off from food. So now we're just past Thanksgiving. It's getting cold, start of December. You've fed everybody up as much as you want and now you're starting to let things change. It should be getting colder outside. This is about the time of year when I start gradually decreasing the daytime temps a bit and allowing night drops in the enclosure. So I'm going to my thermostats and I'm changing the duration that these animals have heat during the day, how hot it gets. It still gets warm during the day, but not quite as warm as full you know, speed in the summer and for nowhere near as long. Instead of the 12 hours on, 12 hours off, it's more like eight to 10 hours. Instead of being in the high 80s, it's more like the low to mid 80s. And at night, over the course of three weeks, I want to gradually bring those night temperatures down to around 70. I want the room ambient getting cold. I've got a window open to help with that, but I'm also bringing their heat down, if not turning it off entirely at night. What this is going to do is going to start the spermatogenesis process in males, which is where the sperm starts to develop in them, and folliculogenesis in females. So this is around that time where you've given them all fall to pack tons of food on, and then right before it hits December, you give them a few weeks with the current temperatures, let them digest, and then we're gonna start dialing down the thermostats. And then we're gonna start pairing. So I'm gonna put this guy in. This is my MIA jungle pairing. And it's the beginning of December, so it's early. I'm not expecting a lot, but early locks do happen. And this is where you're gonna start doing your due diligence, doing a lot of pairing, separating, rinsing, and repeating, and paying a lot of attention, taking lots of notes, seeing who's interested or not. For me, I like to put pieces of painter's tape on enclosures, and I write the dates when I've done some pairings, and if I confirm a lock, I put a little check mark next to it. This way I can sort of have a visual representation of how often I'm pairing the male. You don't want to overbreed your animals. You can breed your males too much to the point where they won't eat, they won't put weight back on, and you can essentially burn them out. Don't want to do that. Um, and then the other thing is it gets you an idea of if they're ramping up to it. So if you start seeing no interest, but then a lot of check marks and a lot of breeding time, then you know you're in that window. If you start getting locks, leave them, let them be, and then once they separate, give the male a rest then pop them back in. Feel free to feed them if you like. Some people do, some people don't. I don't necessarily feed during the winter, but some people like to give their males an extra meal. Doesn't necessarily hurt, but don't be surprised if they refuse food because they might have one thing on their mind. Now, some people do feed females, I do not. At this point, they have been pounded full of food and are ready to rock, so they should not want for food. From the time I start pairing into December to the beginning of February, those are my two crucial months, essentially, all of December, all of January. Those are the months for these winter breeders that I want to be as observant as possible. Now, don't be surprised if you don't catch locks. Many people have successful breedings without ever seeing a lock. These snakes are very cryptic about that, and sometimes that's just the way it is. But what I like to do is check them in the morning, check them in the evening, and just do my due diligence. I'm constantly double checking my thermostats are where I uh, wanted them at and just make sure I didn't skip any. Um, and then I'm just constantly checking my notes, giving males rests, giving them opportunities with the female, making sure they have plenty of time. Um, and so this window of the winter time for these animals is when you should expect to see the most activity. Now I'm not saying you won't see activity in lockups and breeding afterwards. It definitely does happen but this is the essential time. This is the time where you want to be pairing, you want them cooling, all that good stuff. Just because they breed a little bit after when you start bringing temperatures up in February doesn't mean it's too late or something's wrong. So when in doubt, just keep going. Keep that male in, don't pull them out too soon. When it comes to the females during the winter time, there's a lot of behavior I'm looking for. I'm looking for where she's holding her weight. Is she putting a lot of it in this bottom section? How's her body tone? Is she spending a lot of time on the heat or the cold side? Oftentimes leading up to their ovulation, they'll spend a lot of time breeding and then on the cool side, but then when they really get to the close to ovulation, they hug the heat and never let it go. Um, during that time, you really wanna get your eyes on them if you can, because that's when you're gonna start seeing any follicular swelling, uh, which can trick people into pulling their male out soon thinking they've already got an ovulation. 
I recommend leaving your mail in until you see them completely ignoring each other and acting like there isn't another snake in the enclosure. Uh, your males will generally cuddle with females quite often, but if you see the female on one side and the male on the other, especially if it's like April, May, probably done. Um, usually you're getting eggs that time of year. Now this citrus tiger girl, she's produced for me. I kind of know when she goes and she's been spending all of her time on the cold side. We just started doing the, the actual implementation of manually cooling down enclosures and bringing temps down and started pairing. And the male isn't quite ready, but she's definitely building. Now, when you go to do some pairing, if you can, I recommend taking the opportunity to get your hands on your females and try and do some palpating. That will give you an idea if you can practice on whether or not they have follicles and where they're at in their stage. Generally, if you guide them back into their enclosure and they propel themselves under their own momentum and you just do a little bit of hard pressing under the belly, you'll feel consecutive thump, 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 thump if you've got follicles in that female. That's a good indication to keep going. Um, when, like I said, when in doubt, pair it out and just keep the mail in. So they know what they're doing and they will go if you've given them plenty of resources, but sometimes they don't want to go. So the more you can get your hands on them, get your eyes on them without necessarily stressing them out and kind of just observe what their body condition is, what they're doing behaviorally, that will give you a good indication of where they might be at in their cycle. If a male is constantly pacing his enclosure and then you put him with a female and he's glued to her and he's always on top of her, that's a good sign. That means there's still more to go and you're on the right track. So in that December to February window, just keep pairing, keep going and don't stop. You should start seeing locks. You should start seeing females swell and body rolling. All of those are great signs, but don't be surprised if you don't get any signs. Some of them hide it very well. So now you find yourself at the beginning of February. This is around the time when you're going to start doing your cooling down in reverse. You're going to start taking those temperatures back up to what they were before you started cycling. I recommend doing this over a two to three week period. Some people do it instantly. I've always done it gradually. Seems a little more natural. It's seasonally accurate. So, from about February 1 to, you know, second or third week of February, we're going to bring temperatures back up. I'll still be introducing pairs, uh, but I might also be starting to offer food to females as we get towards the, the normal temperatures, see if they're interested, see where they're at. If they're not interested in food and they're looking big and swollen, sitting on the heat and males are just still all over them, don't be surprised that they don't eat, especially your boys. They're busy finishing the job. Keep it going. Um, yeah, just keep pairing. Like I said, don't pull your males if you see a little bit of swelling. Don't pull them until you see the males completely ignoring the females. This is Red Man. He loves his ladies. When you have a great breeding male, they will always tell you when that female is done. So they are interested until the female is not putting out those pheromones anymore. When she's done cycling and gravid or just done and not gonna go, the males will act like they're not even there. So keep that in mind. Keep pairing, use that as your barometer for where you're at, as well as your palpation technique. He's got a second female to go to this year, so he's hitting two females. If you're doing more than uh, one female for a male, keep an eye on them, make sure you're not overworking them, overbreeding them, offer them food if they're looking a little thin. Keep an eye on your boys. February, March, and April is when you really are going to start seeing whether or not these females you've been pairing are going to go for you or not. By April, you should know who is gravid if you don't have eggs on the ground already. Spring breeders would be starting to breed at this point, so your winter breeders should be wrapping up. Um, if it's kind of questionable and you're not sure, chances are it's probably not. Although they can fool you, a gravid female carpet python should look extremely obvious to even the untrained eye that they are massive, they are swollen, they are full of something that's going to come out soon. It's very, very obvious. They look uncomfortable. They're in a tight pretzel. They're squeezing their head almost. They just look like they're about to pop and they're very uncomfortable. So this is a time where you need to have already, in theory, make sure you've got an incubator ready. Even if you plan to do maternal incubation, not every mom is going to wrap the eggs. Not every mom is going to do a great job. So you should have an incubator at the ready just to be safe. Get it running ahead of time so it's warm, so you're not doing things last minute on the cold incubator on the fly, trying to scramble, put things together. You want to be ready and prepared. 
these eggs take about 50 to 60 days to incubate around 87, 88 degrees. Everybody does it a little bit differently. And generally, once I start seeing the first baby's pip, that's when I will uh, assist and manually pip the remaining of the eggs, give them a fighting chance at hatching in case you know, maybe they're tied up around an umbilical cord or the, the caruncle, the egg tooth has fallen off. Uh, you never know. But yeah, at that point, you should be seeing eggs. Your male should definitely not be interested in females and getting back on food. And uh, yeah, if you're gonna do maternal incubation, make sure your female is really well fed, has plenty of space and wraps that clutch nice and, and secure and does a good job. And just, you know, maintain the enclosure as best as you can like you would otherwise and mom will do the rest. Establishing babies is a lot of fun, but uh, it's also a lot of work. And that's gonna have to be its own video because that takes a whole different set of approach, details, things like that. But in general, in general, that sort of approach that I just laid out, cooling or feeding heavy in the fall, cooling at the beginning of, of winter down for a few weeks, keeping them down there for a month and a half, two months, and then bringing them back up over the course of two, three weeks. That's general Python breeding husbandry cycling. That's kind of the long and short of it. So if you hear somebody say general Python cycling attempts, that's kind of what that's about. So that's kind of how I systematically implement, you know, cycling them, food cycling them. Um, I'm also very careful not to run lights after dark. I consider light cycling to be somewhat important. I don't think it's essential, but any little trigger you can implement, I find useful. So you got food cycling, you got temperature cycling, you got light cycling. And that's all gonna essentially help you succeed in this endeavor of breeding carpet pythons. All right, so my Exanic Tiger Boy here that I produced two seasons ago is gonna help me sign off on this one. Hopefully, he is interested in breeding this year. I've got two ladies for him, so for his first season, he's got a tall order, but I have faith in him. His father was breeding at 17 months old and a little bit smaller than this, so uh, these guys have it in spades. They know what they're doing. I'm really excited for every pairing I'm doing this year, which is why I'm doing every pairing. And I hope that you feel this contagious sort of excitement about carpet pythons in the breeding season, if that's your interest and that's your goal as well. I would really love to um, be able to eventually offer a comprehensive series of videos for sort of all the steps. And so this is gonna be sort of like the first one. This is the, the winter breeder carpet python breeding episode, so to speak. Uh, eventually I'll do one on spring breeders, I'll do one on egg incubation, and then eventually I'll probably do one on establishing babies. I'm sure I've done, you know, videos in the past where I've touched on all of this uh, content in the past, but never hurts to uh, update and refresh and go over it again, especially when I've got so many new people to the channel. So if you've made it this far, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions or if there's anything that I glossed over or, or completely skipped, Leave it in the comments below and let me know. Um, if you're an aspiring carpet python breeder, drop a comment. Let me know what you think and why. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And go check out my sponsors, Reptile Husbandry Designs, making the shift from Heli Guy Serpents. They're all over Instagram and their website. And slowly, gradually shifting that name brand, so go check them out. Don't forget Reptiles Express, my favorite shipping company. They take great care of all their people. I've sent a lot of snakes out over the last few years with them and it's been fabulous service. Um, their Premium Crickets LLC is their sister company. So if you happen to be in the East Coast going to shows, you'll see them there. Go show them some love and get some, some bugs or have them shipped to your door because that's what they do best. And if you are not a member of USR from USR Florida, shame on you. Just kidding. We can always fix that though. Go become a member. Membership is important. It can be free, but you can also chip in a little bit financially and help contribute to the folks who are working to keep any unjust and undue legislation off the books that affects our reptiles and our rights and abilities to work with them. We are very privileged, so a little bit of support goes a long way. And last but not least, if you want to support what I'm doing here, I've got a Patreon going, just Riley Jimison on patreon.com. Gets you access to perks, uh, discounts on merch, early access to babies, monthly Zoom meetings, and a whole lot more. And it's just a lot of fun. Got a great Discord community growing, some great people that I consider family and friends. So. Hang out if you want. Otherwise, I will catch you guys on the next one. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you for comments. Thank you for liking and sharing. And I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll see you on the next one.